Are you listening? Uh. Breakthrough yeah. Media. The truth always wins out in the end because it outlives falsehood. Yeah. Quiet, I'm trying to listen. As we're turning in our Bibles, would it be possible to put the second song up again on the screen? Or is that a... Who does that? Okay. The first stanza. All right. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 again. And uh, this will be, Lord willing... The last sermon that we have on this dreadful subject, but absolutely necessary subject of sexual immorality and the need for us to be pure. But before we go to our text, I just wanted to point something out here. I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. So often we can tame these kind of statements. We can make them so clean. And so picturesque. But I want you to think for just a moment exactly what you're saying when you say that I am gazing upon his blood. I want you to think about a Roman cross. I want you to think about the base. Where it's stuck into the ground. The hardened clay. Around the pole. The rough of the wood. The blood that is literally has gushed all over the ground and made it so that Roman soldiers are slipping and sliding to simply pull him down. I want you to think about a massacre. Because only through this kind of death. Do we have peace with God? There was absolutely nothing beautiful. And yet it was the most Beautiful thing that even poets among men or angels couldn't even begin to describe. So often we sing things and yet we don't hold in our heart exactly what we're saying. This was the son of God. Torn to pieces on a tree. Shredded by a whip. And by the wrath of God. It is a horrid thing. It's a beautiful thing. It was a necessary thing. And I say that tonight because this is the great motive for godliness. By common confession, Paul told Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is this gospel truth that leads us to all true devotion and piety. You see, you can clean up your immorality for all the wrong reasons. There are unconverted men that realize that their pornography has done their wife damage and therefore they let it go. But that's not bringing glory to God. We live, we breathe for him. That's our atmosphere. That's the world in which we live. And that must be our motivation for all moral purity. Now, let's read again in chapter four, verse three. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come before you in the name of your son. Lord, even though I've given the admonition, I myself do not understand, Lord, everything that you have done for us on that tree. But Lord, I pray that tonight you would be with us and help us, that you'd give encouragement where encouragement is needed and fear where fear is needed. That you would strengthen and weaken according to your purposes. 
Lord, bring each of your children home to glory. Blameless and without spot. Lord, let our daily life reflect the righteousness in which you have clothed us. In Jesus name. Amen. Now, as I've said in this sermon, we're going to continue on with this theme of one of the greatest expressions of sanctification is moral purity, sexual purity, especially in this day and age that is so dark that everything is filled with sexual immorality. Now, we're going to look tonight at those reasons that we have in Scripture to cause us to abstain from every form of fornication, every form of sexual evil. And there are four things given to us in this text. First of all, we should abstain from sexual immorality because of the judgment of God. Because of the judgment of God. Secondly, secondly, we should abstain because it is contrary to our high calling in Christ Jesus. Totally contrary to the purposes of God in our life at this moment. Thirdly, immorality, sexual immorality, is a rejection not only of the will of God, but I want you to understand it is a rejection of the person of God. It is a direct offense to his person. Finally, sexual immorality demonstrates a gross disregard for the Holy Spirit whom God has given us. Now, let's look at each one of these. First of all, Immorality brings God's judgment. Look in verse six and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, if you look here at the conjunction, because the what it does is opens up the door now for Paul to give us extremely strong exhortation and even stronger warnings with regard to sexual immorality and how we must avoid it at every cost. Now, why should we? He says here, because the Lord is the avenger. In this context, the Lord is referring to Jesus Christ himself. And with this, it helps us begin to maintain a balance, doesn't it? We hear of Jesus as the shepherd, Jesus as the savior. Jesus as full of grace and compassion and mercy. Jesus, the friend of sinners and all that is true. But Jesus is also the avenger. And he takes vengeance and brings judgment, not only outside of the church, but he works it inside of the church. And therefore, those outside with hardened hearts are told that they must fear him. But also those of you who consider yourselves believers must walk in a healthy fear of the Lord. Now, the word avenger here comes from the Greek word ektikos. What does that mean? Ek meaning out of, dike meaning justice. The idea of bringing out justice. And that's what the Lord does among his people. Now I want to look at two Greek scholars to give us a good idea of what avenger means. First, mounts. Now think about this in the context of who it refers to. Jesus Christ. One who dispenses judgment and inflicts punishment. And never forget, Paul's giving this warning in the context of the professing church. Jesus is one who dispenses judgment and inflicts punishment. Also Hebert, one who extracts legal justice from a culprit. You see, these things are very important to understand if we're going to understand who this resurrected Lord truly is. Now, the only other place in the New Testament where this word avenger in the Greek is used is in Romans chapter 13, verse 4. And it's used with reference to the government. And I'm just going to read to you the passage. For it, the government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now, in this context, let's draw forth something of a definition. Now, remember, it's specifically talking about the government, but it has a wider application. Three things. 
The avenger is one who bears a sword, not a spanking paddle. A sword. Secondly, he brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And thirdly, he should be feared. He should be feared. Now, there is a proper sense in which all these things can be said of Jesus Christ, even in the context of the church. Now, the Christ, the fact that Christ is referred to here as an avenger. And it's in the context of church. What does that do for us? First of all, it shows us the severity of the crime of sexual immorality. That it is not something that the Lord will delay with very long. He will deal with it. It is severe. It is a horrid crime. I know we commonly say all sin is bad sin and there's some truth in that. But we need to realize there are certain sins in the New Testament that when God speaks about them, he does it with a tremendous severity. This is a severe crime. And also, it brings severe consequences. That it would use the term avenger, applying it to Jesus Christ in the context of the professing church, would let you know this is very serious. I want you to know something. There are times when you should be afraid. And there are times when you should be afraid of God and you should be afraid of His Christ. Who is God and Lord and King of Kings. Never forget that. You and Jesus ain't got your own thing going. Jesus is not your buddy. He loves you with a love that goes beyond poets. But remember who he is. He is your elder brother. But your elder brother is the Lord of glory. Now, how do we explain the fact that this word avenger is used of Christ, but in the context of the professing church? Well, I want us just to look at two things. First of all, the one committing sexual immorality. It is very in in the professing church. It is very possible that his practice of sexual or her practice also supplies to women also. That his or her practice of immorality is just exposing a deeper root problem of unconversion. That this is a false convert. That could be the possibility. And in the case of a false convert within the church, Christ treats them as an unbeliever. And the justice is punitive and can be described as wrath. He will clean his church of such a person. But the text can also be referring to a believer. And in the case of a believer, this vengeance that the Lord takes will manifest itself in what we know of as redemptive discipline. But here's something that I want to point out. You see, when I talk about the Lord as the avenger and the Lord pouring out wrath on the unconverted in the church, who's contaminating the church with its sexual immorality, when I use the word wrath, You have something of a fear, but you say, that doesn't apply to me. And so when I use the idea of discipline, you go, whew, that's not so bad. You've got a very poor understanding of discipline. You have a very wrong understanding of discipline. Because discipline in the people of God and in the church of Jesus Christ can be Terrifying. Redemptive? Yes. But terrifying. I want to just read to you Hebrews 12, 6. Just listen. Speaking about the believer and the Lord's discipline. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. Mastigao. It means to beat with a whip. In the context of of this area of the world and at this time, people were whipped 
Not only in the Roman culture, but in many cultures. And we're talking about someone who is strung up with both arms spread out, their back made bare. Possibly they are tied over a log or a rock in order to expose the fullness of their back. And they are whipped until their back is shredded. And they had it down to a science so that they knew one more stroke will kill them. And therefore we stop. So when we talk about the Lord's discipline, I don't want you to just breathe a sigh of relief and think of it as a spanking. He truly knows how to discipline his people. Listen to another text in Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of. Of the living God. Do you see what's being said here? Now, there, there, there's something in me that would be prone to say, I'm going to dissect this. I'm going to make it easier. I'm going to try to explain it away. But no, I want you just to hear the text. Because it is in the context of the believing community. And you need to know this. You need to fear sin. You need to fear sexual immorality. Like the plague. Worse than the plague. Because someone can die of the plague and it not be their fault. They'll not be held accountable on the day of judgment. But in sexual immorality, you will. You will. Dr. D. Michael Martin New American Commentary, he says this. Now listen. The objects of this divine retribution are the members of the church who have violated God's commands and wronged the brethren. Divine judgment is inescapable even for those who are in the church. Salvation does not grant believers the right to sin without suffering the consequences. If we only had a handful of men that feared nothing, but God and sin. It could turn the world upside down. Now, when is this time of avenging? Well, ultimately, it's eschatological. Ultimately, it's the final judgment when Christ will render unto every man according to that which is due him. There is so much about the final judgment of the believer that I cannot explain to you. I can't put it all together in a unified thought. So I believe that the best thing to do is hold it in, to, in attention. The fact is that we will stand justified before God. The fact is we will be judged. And each man will receive according to what he has done. Rendered unto him. Not with regard to salvation, no. But with regard to something. That is very important because it's repeated over and over and over again. I want you to know you will stand before God. You will be judged. Yes, his blood. Will make way for you. His judge, his blood. Is sufficient, but know this, you will stand before him. And not just with regard to sexual immorality. Our slothfulness. The sins that we allow to continue on in our lives like weeds that we do not root out of a garden on and on. I want you to know these things are to be taken seriously and you need to deal with them. And so do I. I would not be a minister of Christ if I stood up here and just basically told you, don't worry about the day of judgment. It'll be a cakewalk. No, you'll be peeled back and everything will be exposed. So understand this. It's a serious, serious thing. Now, I said that ultimately this vengeance is eschatological, but it also can be temporal. This has been seen throughout the history of the church. It's been seen in many churches, even as we speak here. And it's seen in the scriptures. There are times when Christ simply comes. And he comes in judgment. This is specifically set out for us in the book of Revelation, chapter two and three, when he is speaking to the churches in Asia Minor. He says some very, very hard things. I want to give you just something from the, third, the church in Thyatira. Listen to what Christ says. 
But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Now look at that. And one of the greatest Proofs that God is not among a great majority of evangelicalism today is because we do not see these kinds of judgments in the church. We don't see it. People go on and on in their sexual immorality and there's affairs and fornication and adultery. And the church just goes on. But when the church is truly belonging to Christ. You can see terrible things. Frightening things. God will expose it in a moment, even though it's been a sin of years, he'll expose it in a moment and deal with it publicly. So that others will fear so that other churches will fear and other believers will fear. You need to realize this, all of us. Need to make our way right with God. We need to take sin seriously. Now. I want you to look, Paul says here in, in our verse. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, there are two great truths that I want to point out for you here. First of all, notice this. This was a baby church. This was a very young church. And Paul had already taught them about the judgment of Christ in the church. It means that it was a foundational, fundamental Doctrine of the Christian faith that should be taught early to the believer, especially with regard to sexual immorality. But, but let me ask you a question. How often do you hear this in the church today? How often do you hear that from the national pulpits? How often do you hear warnings to flee from these things because they bring the judgment of Christ? Another thing that we need to see from this text is Paul says, I solemnly warned you. And basically what he's saying is, I solemnly warned you then and I'm solemnly, solemnly warning you now. It was something that he did with regularity. It is something he saw need of that we're constantly needing to hear what? Not only the songs of Zion that were justified by the blood, but we're also in need of hearing. There is a judgment. There is a payday someday. And whatever sins have gotten root in our life, we need to deal with them now. Especially with regard to sexual immorality. Now, Paul uses the phrase here solemnly warned. It can mean to solemnly testify or to warn earnestly with a great deal of seriousness and passion. Now, I want you to think about this word solemnly warned. It is the same word used in the book of Luke. When when the rich man is in hell. And he begs permission to step out of hell for just a moment in order to do what? In order to solemnly warn his brothers not to come to this place of torment. Now, I want you to think about this. If someone had the opportunity and the will to come out of hell to warn someone they loved, how would they do it? Would they be passionate or dispassionate? Would they be earnest or would they be apathetic? They would have the greatest degree of earnestness. They would be like a man screaming at a child to get off a train track before the train passes. And this is what we have here in this truth. Paul is saying, I solemnly warned you. And I solemnly warn you again and again and again. Hebert says this. It was a warning intended to penetrate their conscience. One thing about preaching that's true, it is not just intended to inform. 
It is intended to pierce the conscience and transform. And that's why the preacher is so pitiful, because apart from the power of God, that's not going to happen. I pray tonight that the spirit of God would do more than the words of some small preacher. That you would have some sort of a fear with regard to these things. You would avoid them like the plague. Calvin said men's dullness is such that unless they are struck forcefully, they have no sense of the divine judgment. It's right. Sleeping, sleeping, wake up, sleeper, wake up, realize how awful this is. There's warnings all through the Bible with regard to sexual immorality. Let me just give you one. Proverbs six. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? And he's talking about sexual immorality. And then he goes on to say, for the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord and he watches all his paths. There's nowhere you can go to commit these things that the Lord does not see you and take it to account. Nowhere you can hide from your wife, you can hide from your friends, you can hide from a religious community. You can hide from all of us, but you cannot hide from him. That all of us would have this hyper consciousness of the omniscience of God, because it is a great bulwark against sin. It will protect us. And then he said his own iniquities will capture the wicked and he will be held with the cords of his sin. This is terrifying. Held with the cords of sin. Bondage. And what does a believer have to do with this sort of bondage? Christ has saved us to make us free. Hebert, again, the first reason appeals to the fear of the consequences of disobedience. So many people, when you talk about you need to fear God to stop doing that, they go, well, that's not really a motive. It is a motive. It is a motive. It's a true motive. It's a motive that can save your life. Hebert says the first reason appeals to the fear of the consequences of disobedience. Now, listen to this. Paul might have appealed to the bitter physical, psychological and social consequences of immorality. He could have said, you're going to hurt your wife. You're going to hurt your husband. You're going to hurt your children. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. It's going to mess up every all your plans. That's not what Paul did. His emphasis rather is eschatological. The coming judgment day, a just God and a coming day of judgment are factors that cannot be left out of consideration when dealing with moral problems. Why would John the Baptist come and say, flee? Why would the prophets say, flee from the wrath to come? Now, let's go on to our second reason for avoiding immorality. It's contrary to our high calling. Look in verse seven, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Now, the first reason Paul gives to avoid immorality is what? The fear of the Lord. Judgment. You're going to stand before God, and that is a valid reason. But there is a higher and nobler and even more God honoring reason. What is it? The kindness of God. And the high calling that he has given us. Us. Look at us. Not many noble. At least in this pulpit, me, not many wise. Commoners. Less than commoners. But look at the high calling that's been given to us. Some of us drunks. Fornicators, drug addicts. But look at the high calling that has been given to us. We should never go back. We should never go back. It is contrary to what's been done to us by God. Now. I want to look at this as the text does first negatively and then positively negatively for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity. Now, there's a passive voice here and what it refers to is that the calling our calling was God's design. It was God's doing and it has involved in it God's 
purpose. And that purpose that God has for you, believer, has absolutely nothing to do with sexual impurity. Nothing. They are complete opposite ends. They are contradictory. They do not go together. You cannot take sexual immorality and somehow fit it somewhere into the Christian life. You cannot. It has to be eradicated immediately. It doesn't fit into God's purpose and God's plan for you. Now, the word impurity here, akatharsia, what does it mean? It's a word that can be translated uncleanliness, lewdness. It refers to that which is filthy, that which is dirty. Now, why am I saying this? Because I want us to see sin the way God sees it. I want us to see sexual impurity the way God sees it as lewd, as filthy, as disgusting, as revolting. Now, do not take me wrong. God created sex. And in its proper context, it is holy, it is pure, it is a gift from God. But outside of those parameters that God has set, it is lewd and filthy. Now, the same word here, uncleanliness or impurity, is used in Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of men, dead men's bones and all uncleanness. I remember two times in my life, and both of them were in Peru. I walked into a cemetery years and years ago, back in the early 80s, into Peru in a cemetery, and they had been working on a body that apparently they had just forgotten about or left. And I walked in there and there it was right in front of me, a rotting corpse. And then well, I could say a third time, I remember one time a friend of mine thought his brother had been killed in the war. And so we went to the morgue together. I will never forget the grotesqueness of what I saw in that place. I remember one time Chato and I were stranded in the city of Trujillo because of a great flood and it had washed all the tombs up and they floated into the center part of the city. Now, the world, what does it do? It, it takes sexual immorality and sensuality and dresses it up in the body of a beautiful woman or in the body of a handsome man. I have to say both of these things because I want you to know that our society is becoming so corrupt that it's not just men anymore that deal with these kind of issues. It's women. The world will dress up sensuality in some beautiful body. But what you need to see in God's eyes, it is a stinking, rotten corpse. A woman without discretion. It's like a gold ring and a pig snout. That you would come to the point where you would see these types of things, see these types of people, and they would not be a draw to you. They would be repulsive to you. And I am really, really sick and tired. Of hearing ministers say that that stuff really is beautiful and you just have to fight it. Now, none of us are immune to it, but I want to tell you something. If you're renewing your mind in God's word and you're growing in Christ, you will reach a point, young man. You will reach a point, young woman, where it is repulsive to you. That you do see it like God sees it. He's called us to change, not just to cope. So tired of that psychology that's entered into the church today. Well, just cope. Just cope. No, overcome. Overcome these things. Now, positively, why did God call us? Not for sexual impurity. So we would expect he would say then in the next phrase, but for sanctification. But that's not what he does. He says not for sexual impurity, but in sanctification, in holiness, in consecration. And it's very difficult, but here's basically the meaning that some of the. Well, that a conclusion I've come to personally, but also that is backed up by others, uh, better and greater scholars than myself. It means that believers have been called into a sphere. 
It's a locative into a sphere or a realm of holiness. And that in this kingdom in which we now exist, holiness. Well, let me put it this way. It's the atmosphere we breathe. This kingdom of Christ is a kingdom of holiness, a sphere, a realm of holiness that we've been called out of, translated out of a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. And we should be light. We should be light and we can be light. Do you understand me? Just stop this idea of cope. Yes, there are struggles in the Christian life and they'll be there all our lives. At the same time, though, we are overcoming these things. We are growing. We're not just here to cope. We're here to have victory. And victory does not mean material prosperity. Victory means godliness, conformity to Jesus Christ. And that is a real possibility. Where we are now, beloved, it's not a place where things like sexual immorality should be mentioned. Shouldn't even be mentioned. Let me give you some wonderful cross references here. Second Timothy one nine, Paul writes, Timothy, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the holy one who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. I could give you so many more, but we simply don't have time. But the whole Bible is crying out, not just for you to get back into the garden. But for you to reflect the purity that was there, the life that was there, and more so now in Christ. Now, a third reason for rejecting immorality is that it is a rejection of God. Look in verse 8. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his spirit to you. And what does he mean? It, the, the logic is basically like this. Since God is the one who is calling you to be holy, he's the one that's doing it. Therefore, your rejection of the holiness of God in favor of sexual immorality is not only a rejection of the will of God, but it is a rejection of the person of God. Now, the word rejecting comes from a Greek word that means not only to reject, but to annul, to set aside, or to treat something basically with contempt. As though it were something of no or at least little account. With regard to God's commands, what does it mean? It means to reject God's commands, to annul them, to set them aside. And this is where, again, immaturity is when you will see people who are so strict in one tiny little area of their life, nitpicking, eating other people alive, and yet on the other side, gross sin. Because they've decided that certain commands they're going to grab a hold of and other commands they're just going to annul. And usually the commands that they choose to keep are the ones that are external, that can show some external piety, that can give proof to others in the eyes of others that they are something they are not. But the inward commands is the ones they let go of and those begin to eat at them like poison, like rust, like corrosion. Now, There is in the Bible a relationship, and I want us to see this relationship between despising God's commands and despising God. You see, you can't separate the two things. That's why sometimes I'll tell young believers that I've discipled, look, I don't walk around. 
I love the law of God. I meditate in the law of God, the law of God. But I don't walk around thinking I'm going to break this rule. I'm going to break this rule. I don't want to break this rule. I need to be careful. I look at it personally. I walk around as realizing I'm a temp, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit and I don't want to offend the person. It's not so much breaking a rule as it is breaking a rule and offending a person who dwells within me. I want to show you the relationship between despising God and despising his commands in Malachi chapter one, six and seven, verses six and seven. Listen to what it says. A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? And then he goes on, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. Well, how did we? What are you talking? What he's saying is this. You despised me when you despised my commands. The way you look at my word is the way you look at me. That's just true. How many times have we heard from friends and spouses? Look, don't talk to me about what you're going to do. Just do it. Prove to me. Prove to me by what you say. By your deeds, prove that it's true. And we need to realize that. The way we look at God's commands says a lot about the way we look at him. Leon Morris says this, the person who takes sexual sin lightly, who sees it as something that does not matter much, is in effect treating God as of no account for the prohibition is his. Now. Again, and we're going to really hit on this in the last point, but I want you to see something. This is not about just some impersonal command. It's not about, well, if I do this, I'm going to mess my life up or I'm going to hurt my wife or my family or or my husband, or my family, whatever. It is ultimately an offense against God. David sinned against himself, his wife, Uriah, Bathsheba, their family, Israel, everything else. He sinned against everybody. But what did he say? Above all things, I've sinned against you. And I want you to look at this in the context, not just of an avenger, but as a gift giver, as a father, as a brother, as someone who died on Calvary for you. Look at this personally, relationally. Why am I not going to commit this sin? Because it offends the one who is at this moment present. See, if we would just really grab a hold of the omnipresence of God, it would really change things, wouldn't it? Because a man does not commit adultery in the presence of his wife. He's going to look for some place she is not. Well, would you commit it in the presence of God? You say no. Well, then do you not understand the doctrine of omnipresence? He's everywhere in his fullness all the time. And children, listen to me. You think that because your parents don't see you. Or someone doesn't see the inner workings of your heart or the motives or what you're saying or how you're hurting someone else. You think your parents don't see that. Are you really that foolish, young child? Do you not know that God sees you? He does. Takes it into account. Now, fourthly, immorality demonstrates a gross disregard for the spirit whom God has given us. Verse eight, so he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his spirit to you. Literally, in the Greek, it's present tense. He says, the one who is giving you the Holy Spirit. Now, this does not mean that God is continuously giving us the Holy Spirit. The reason for the present tense is to denote something constant about God. God is the giver. Always has been, always will be. If someone has the Holy Spirit, if someone is blessed with the Holy Spirit, it is God who is the giver of the Holy Spirit. Also, it's in present tense to denote that God is continually working 
through the Holy Spirit in the life of his people. And why? To make them holy. To make them holy. And do you see why now sexual immorality is such a contradiction? When the primary purpose of God in your life is to make you like Jesus, which is just another way of saying to make you holy. And that God has given us the spirit, not just for uh, comfort, not just for encouragement. The spirit is constantly working to do what? To make us holy, to transform us into the image of Christ. Now, I want us to look at four possible applications here. What happens when someone involves themselves in sexual immorality? What happens? What does it demonstrate? First of all, it demonstrates ingratitude. An extreme lack of appreciation for the God who has given us the most indescribable gift. Himself. In the person of his spirit. We must ask ourselves, is this how we repay God? Is this a proper response? Secondly, there's a nonchalant attitude toward his holiness. Now, if you look in our text in verse eight. The phrase who gives the Holy Spirit to you is literally this. Who gives the spirit of him, the Holy One to you. The entire structure of the text is to give emphasis to one main controlling idea. And what is that? There is a reason why the spirit is called Holy Spirit. The emphasis here is that the spirit is holy. I find it I find it at least noteworthy that we don't hear much about Holy Father. Or even Holy Son. Even though they are holy, holy, holy. But it isn't amazing that when we talk about the spirit of God, it is almost always the Holy Spirit. We know he is God's spirit because his chief characteristic is perfect holiness. All other spirits are what? Unclean spirits. But the Holy Spirit is holy. Even the emphasis on holiness and the conception of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Holy, not some horrid pagan myth. But something holy and innocent and pure. Now. How can we give ourselves to uncleanliness when the very one who dwells within us is the epitome of holiness? And remember, the body is a vessel of the Holy Spirit. How can we in any way defile or desecrate this temple? When the Holy Spirit is dwelling within it. Now, a third thing that I want to say, it's a carelessness to grieve the Holy Spirit. And I've already touched on this, but when we sin, especially when we commit sexual immorality, there is a carelessness with regard to grieving him. And I really want to point out some things here. First of all, let me read a text. Uh, Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then verse three of chapter five, which is in the same context, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Again, before don't want to run a rabbit here, but I find it really amazing that sexual immorality and greed are mentioned together again. And I think it's because they're so much alike. Because greed and sexual immorality is truly about self-love and self-gratification. It's stinginess. It's not thinking about the other person, their benefit, their blessing. It's about all about me. And that's why it's mentioned together. But it's also in the context of grieving the Holy Spirit, showing us that one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit is most grieved is through the sexual immorality of God's people. Now. Here's where I want to stop and I want to set the record straight. And this is it really important because I don't think that we really understand what we're saying. We talk about grieving the Holy Spirit as though he was almost like a whipping boy. Or we just we grieved him. Or I grieved the spirit or I grieved the spirit here. I did. We say it so nonchalantly. 
I don't know if any of you men remember this, but I remember it the first time after I was married that I grieved my wife. You know, you go through the honeymoon, you go through and you come to a point doesn't take long where you fail your wife. And not only do you fail her, you see it in her face. And how that ought to break our hearts. And yet we say so nonchalantly, well, I grieve the Holy Spirit as though it were some small thing. But my main point here is this. The Holy Spirit is referred to often as a dove. Came in the form of a dove. Which indicates a lot of things. One of the things is that the Holy Spirit is so easily offended. But don't take the example any further. I don't want you to think that the Holy Spirit is harmless. That he's like a little dove you can shoo away. Or like something you can just kick and make run away. That it grieves, that he grieves over in a corner somewhere and weeps and has no recourse. I want you to know that's the furthest thing from the truth. I want you to know it is extremely dangerous to grieve the Holy Spirit. It is extremely dangerous to grieve the Holy Spirit. I want to read you a text. Just just listen. Isaiah 63, 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself To become their enemy. And he fought against them. Let's just read that again. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Israel, God's people, rebelled and grieved God's Holy Spirit. And so God turned himself to become their enemy. And he fought against them. God does not take it kindly when we grieve. His spirit. It is an offense. And he will act accordingly. Lastly, fourthly, a neglect to 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 be given over to sin, especially the sin of sexual immorality, is to neglect to avail oneself of the spirit's aid in order to overcome. And that's something. Listen to me. Those of you who are more reformed, you speak a great deal about the sovereignty of God. I I love the sovereignty of God. I love that doctrine, but I am afraid that so many people allow it to make them passive, to make them kind of throw up their hands. Well, whatever will be, will be. Well, you know, if God wanted to, he could have helped me there, but he didn't. There must be a purpose in it. Don't ever use that kind of language. Never. The sovereignty of God does not make us passive with regard to sin. It should make us bold to overcome sin. You and I can overcome. You and I can make progress. The Son has set us free. The Spirit of God has power without measure. When we see these weak things in our life, when we see these failures in our life, our problem is not the weakness. Our problem is where we run. We must run to Christ. We must run to his word. We must draw from his strength. John Walvoord says this, lest anyone feel that God is asking more than is reasonable of weak mortals. Paul concluded this exhortation with a reminder that God has also given believers the indwelling spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit has power enough to enable any Christian to learn how to control his own body, even in a pagan, immoral climate. The exhortation is to avoid sexual immorality. The enablement comes from the Holy Spirit. Hebert, quoting Plummer, says this, the spirit supplies not only the desire, but also the ability to live a life of purity. His indwelling puts an end to the pagan plea that man has no power to resist impure desires. For believers to go on living in immorality is to repudiate the gracious provision of God for holiness and invites his sure judgment. As the avenger of sin. The way to escape the avenger. Is to fly to the giver. And accept. Accept. His. And cherish. 
His gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, there is power, believers. Come on. There is power not to cope. Not to cope, but to walk in victory. You see, there's always there's always just these two extremes. There's this on this one hand, it's all about victory and the Christian will never struggle, never have battles, never have failures. The Christian can reach a type of perfection and all that stuff is nonsense. And yet on the other hand, there's this group over here that the best you can be is a rotten, filthy sinner. And both those things are tremendously awkward in the light of the New Testament. Both of them are wrong. The fact is there are battles, there are struggles, and there will be all our life. And the fact is we can be overcomers. We can gain ground. We can root out these things in our life. And I want you to see that. I don't want this church just sitting there. Like some stimuli response plant without a brain. I want us to see. We can take these sins in the power of Jesus name and the power of the Holy Spirit. We can get victory. And don't look behind you. Don't say I've made so little progress. So when did when did your past start defining what your future was supposed to be? God's word defines our future. Okay, you and I have not availed ourselves as we should. In the past, with regard to holiness, but that doesn't dictate how our future will be. We can be more. More loving, more merciful, kinder, gentler. We can control our mouth, we can control our attitudes. We can walk in the fullness of the spirit. God's not done with me. He's not done with you. We can be so much more and you ought to rejoice in that. There is power without measure. Yes, counseling is necessary. Yes, talking to other brothers and sisters in Christ, but I'm I'm sorry. The great need is just the working of the spirit in our life. Running to him in prayer, calling out to Christ. Renewing our mind in his word. And sometimes. I know this sounds very humanistic, but we need to hear it because we're so about sovereignty. Sometimes you just need to you just need to do it. Because you can. Because of him. Because of him. Be encouraged, saints. Go out there now. Attack this stuff. We always think of battles, don't we? As You think of battles as evangelism. Battles and missions. Battles in growing a church. Battles in doing this. No. The primary battle is within you. Those sins that have hampered and hindered you. Write them down. Go after them. Not in a sense of just picking each one and trying to find some method of discipline. No. But laying them before the Lord. Growing holistically in the scriptures, renewing your mind. And and look, if, if you think that there's failure, that there's just no way to overcome these problems in your marriage, in your personal life, and you think there's just no way, then you're not going to try. But the Bible is a ray of hope. It tells us God can do more. Have hope. Hope strengthens. Hope strengthens. You can, you can, you can, you can. Because of Him, because of Him, because of Him. Let's pray. Breakthrough Media